Yeah, we're ready. Gavin's ready. <laughs> Gavin and I have like have been going back and forth with emails, you know, for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> so, and uh, this was like my first time to be in the Billings Library. This is kind of exciting. Like, it's really kind of wonderful. Like that. And I want to thank the House of Books um, for providing books. Like that, and being so supportive. Like that, and, and thank the the Billings Library for allowing us to have this this evening of debauchery. Like that, that you know. <laughs> Will probably in no way resemble a literary event. I'll go ahead and warn you now. Like, so, that, not if you our, have anything to do with it. Like, so, you know. That's our specialty. <laughs> so, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and welcome to the Billings Public Library. Thank you for sharing your Friday evening with us. My name is Gavin Wolter. I'm the director of this fine establishment. We are very excited to offer, in partnership with this House of Books, what we're calling an evening with Craig uh, Johnson and Marcus Red Thunder. Uh, this event is being uh, streamed via Facebook Live right now, so please silence your phones. It will also be recorded so that uh, Community 7 will be airing it at later dates. During the Q&A portion of, of uh, tonight's event, we'll ask that you speak up a little louder. There's a microphone from the ceiling right there. So if you articulate well, the folks that watch us on TV will be able to hear this. Copies of Craig's newest book, amongst others, uh, Daughter of the Morning Star, are available for purchase at the back of the room through this house of books. So a brief introduction, although I think those stories really in introduced himself. Uh, Craig Johnson's New York Times best-selling author of the Longmire uh, Mysteries, the basis for the hit Netflix original series Longmire. He is the recipient of the Western Writers of America Spur Award for fiction and the Mountain and Plains Independent Booksellers Association's Reading the West Book Award for Fiction. His novella, Spirit of Steamboat, was the first one book Wyoming selection. He lives in Ucross, Wyoming, population 25. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Craig Johnson and Marcus Red Thunder. Thank you. There are some more seats down here in the front for those of you people who are standing in the back. Like, and it's not like church. We don't call on you just because you're in the front. Like, it's okay. Sinners in the back. That's right. That's right. That's where we'd be, I'm afraid. Like, that's a, <laughs> so, well, this is wonderful. Like, it's always great. It's always magical whenever I can get Marcus like, to come out and, and do one of the events with me. Like, that. He, it, you generally come down for Longmire Days pretty much every time, though. Like, yeah. That's because there are movie stars there, right? Is yeah. That why? This okay. year, it was just you and I. It was. It was just the two of us. Yeah. Like, you know, so... <laughs> We had to do a lot of virtual events like in the last two years, but next year is our 10th anniversary for Longmire Days. How many of you guys know about Longmire Days? Like it's a lot of you do. Okay. How many of you guys have been to Longmire Days? Oh, okay. So only a certain number of crazy people actually in the room then. Okay. Because it's kind of like a FEMA disaster is really what it's like. It really is. Like it was, um, what, what we did, like the first year that we had, um, we had the actors come up, um, the, uh, they, they came up like it, and you know, we really didn't know what to expect. We really didn't. And so I go to pick up Robert Taylor, like who plays Walt on the TV show, and I'm driving us into town. And he asked me, he was like, how many people do you think they're going to be? And I said, I don't know, Robert. I said, you know, maybe two or 3,000 people or something like that. And so we get there, and by the time we pull up to where the courthouse is there in Buffalo, and the hill drops off, you know, and you can do it, see the main street and everything, there, the barricades are all the way across the street. And all the Buffalo police and Johnson County Sheriff's Department guys, who I, I know, all of them, are all turning around and looking at me, and they're real pissed. <laughs> and I was like, this is not good. <laughs> and so we, we kind of, like, raise up in the truck to look up, you know, and, and see down onto the main street down there. And it's like wall-to-wall -wall people, I mean, for as far as you can see. And Robert Taylor looks, and he goes, I'm no math major, but that looks like more than two to 3,000 people to me. Like a, and there was like over 10,000 people. It was like close to 15,000 people, I think it was, for that, for that year. And um, the problem was all of the grocery stores and restaurants ran out of food. All of like the banks and ATM machines ran out of money. And everybody was like walking around with their cell phones because we only have one tower, all right, in the whole city of Buffalo. Like, and so everybody had their phones out and they were walking around trying to get service, walking around in circles like this, you know. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's why Walt Longmire doesn't carry a cell phone, okay, just so you know. Like, but, uh, but yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's continued on. Like, next year is our 10th anniversary. Um, for Longmire Days, like it, and so it's going to be really crazy, like it. So we'll see. We may have some special guests, you know, show up along with all the actors that we normally have too. We, so. we have an Indians versus Cowboys softball game. 
Yeah, I think we won the first year. And you did because that, you, you pulled a ringer. Like uh, Marcus yeah. went around to like every softball team in Montana, <laughs> on every res in Montana, and they came down and played these unsuspecting Cowboys. It was like the 27 Yankees is what it was like. like at, I mean, you know, it was hilarious because, I mean, every, every hit was like a, a home run. And they told us after that, this is just a family thing. You don't need to do that, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> So the next eight years, they did what we did the first year. <laughs> and they won all the ones since eight years. Uh. That's actually one of my favorite parts of the whole event, I have to admit, because A. Martinez, um, our good friend A. Martinez, yeah. like that, he manages uh, the, the, the native team, and he manages it as... Uh, the character of Jacob Nighthorse. Yeah, and uh, so he's got a rule book that it, hey, he quotes from that looks kind of handmade. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he kind of changes the rules as the game goes along and everything. So he does yeah. a pretty fantastic job. Like yeah. that. And John McLaren Zon. was our umpire. For, he's been our umpire for a couple of years now. And, yeah, ever uh, since he struck out in softball. Yeah. <laughs> He put him as umpire. <laughs> <laughs> he changed positions. Yeah. Like it, so. so, well, anyway, it's great to have you guys here. Like it's wonderful um, to have you guys here. Like that. This is um, our, our our event tonight is um, about the newest book. Like that, and um, this one's kind of kind of near and dear to me for a number of different reasons. Like it, and I I kind of went back and and f remembered um, where it was that the initial idea you know, for this book actually came from. And it was actually when you and I were doing a library event about two years ago in Hardin. And um, we were getting ready to go up there and do the event. Like at, and I remember standing in the lobby, and there was a bulletin board in the lobby of the Hardin uh, uh, library. And I remember looking up and seeing on the bulletin board there was a missing persons poster was what it was. like, at, And it was like this homemade you know, somebody had made it on a computer, you know, and, and put it up there. And the strange thing about it was it had been hanging there for like about a year. And the, the, the terrifying thing about it was is that the light from the glass doors um, would go all the way around the room and go all the way halfway across that bulletin board and then stop halfway across this young woman's face. And so what had happened was the sun had faded out the photograph, one half of it, and half of the information. So there was like, you know, the contact information, the information about, you know, the clothes that the young woman had been wearing, the date that she had been lost, all of these things like that were half gone. And every time like the door would open, you know, that sheet would like rustle like a leaf, you know, every time. And I remember standing there looking at that poster like that and just being, you know, gut shot from it because I thought to myself, what could be worse than having someone you love just disappear? I mean, I, the people that I've talked to that have said, you know, had these kind of similar kind of instances happen in their lives, their statement is, is that it, it's almost better to know. It's almost better to actually, you know, realize the situation, no matter how horrific it was, than to just never know. I mean, it's just like an open wound that never closes, it seems like. And so I started doing a little bit of research on it at that point in time, and it's horrific when you start looking at the numbers and see the number of people that on in Indian country, like at, of Native people that have like disappeared. And the numbers, particularly in, in Montana, are absolutely horrifying. Like, I mean, I, I, I found out that, like, you know, it was something like, I think the FBI report came out for just last year, and there were, like, over 7,000 indigenous peoples in this country that have gone completely missing, and they don't have any idea, you know, where they went, what happened to them, nothing. Like, I, Mark Gordon just came out and said there were, you know, like close to, like, 700, you know, uh, you know, native individuals like that that had gone missing in the state of Wyoming in the last 10 years, and they just don't have any idea, you know, where they've gone or what happened to them. A full quarter of the missing persons in Montana are native and I don't have to tell you how small the percentages is, is like that of you know what they make up of less the population of Montana yeah less than 10 percent the population of Montana yeah and over 25 percent of, of missing persons which yeah. is just absolutely crazy right. like it and so when I started seeing the numbers on that you know I thought okay population mm -hmm. yeah yeah you might be right 
but we were, I was trying to figure out, you know, like, you know, I mean, it's one thing to have an issue, you know, to have a, a social issue that you want to, like, try and address, but, you know, the difficulty is, is like, you know, well, how do you address it? You know, what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with that issue? And I didn't want to write another one of those, like, manhunt in the snow, you know, kind of books. Like, you know, I've done that, or a lot of people have done that, like, and done it well. Like, and so I thought, I want to try and do something a little bit different, like that. And we got a, an opportunity, like, that, to go up. Um, a good friend of ours, like, at uh, Tiger Scalp Cane, invite us up. Is Tiger here? Is Tiger out there somewhere? He was going to show up tonight. So he may be here tonight before it's all over with. But um, he's the athletic director um, in Lame Deer at the high school. And, uh, and so he invited us up. There was a game going on, and it was Lame Deer versus um, Lodge Grass. And those of you who think that the Indian Wars are over, <laughs> I have some bad news. Look at it. <laughs> I have never seen, and this was like, I've never seen so many headbutts, elbows, hip checks in my entire life. And this was the girls' <laughs> high school basketball teams we were watching. They were vicious. They were absolutely vicious. Like, I, But it's like the most incredible game like to watch because res ball is totally different, you know, from like, you know, just regular basketball. I mean, it's, it's speed. It's fast break basketball constant. You know, I mean, it's just an amazing thing to watch. I swear, I think you, if you, by the time you're 18, you're too old to play that game. <laughs> yeah, they run, run and gun. It's, uh, it's actually a technique that uh, Gordon Realbird, he's talked about it. He's a uh, Montana State head uh, coach of the year for many years and coached like multi-state championship teams in lodge grass. He would actually calculate it down to how many times back and forth they would, their team would need to be each quarter to run the other team down. They just have heart and they don't quit. You know, them boys just run and run and run. I run forever. It's a different kind of game, yeah, I tell you. Yeah. But it's also like, especially when it's like the girls playing, like that, because I will openly admit that I will, I would rather watch women do anything rather than watch men do it. I have to admit that's a weakness <laughs> of mine. Like, but nonetheless, like there was like a real kind of beauty to the game that they were playing, like that. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't even watch the NBA because it doesn't look like anything at all like the game that I played when I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there were two things. Like that, first of all, like that, you know, there was a lot more strategy to the game that they played and a lot of poetry to the game that they played, like at the way that they played it. And, you know, between that, like that, and, you know, just the, the, the fervent, you know, way that they played that game. They were just so infused, you know, with, you know, this, this game. You know, it was just really something to watch. And it just really struck me. I remember walking out of there and thinking to myself, okay, that's, that's the story. That's where the story needs to take place is out on that court is where it has to take place. Like, and so I thought, okay, if you've got this young girl, like at, uh, Jaya Long, and, you know, she's this incredible phenom, like at, and she's complex. She's a complex, you know, character. Um, but she starts getting these death threats is what she starts getting, you know, um, where people are threatening her life. Um, as she plays the game, like it, and um, it's something that has to kind of be taken very seriously because she lost her older sister a year earlier because she went missing, um, just completely missing, and nobody knows what happened to her or anything. And so she's this, this, this presence, um, you know, in Jaya's life, like that. And so she's a phenomenal basketball player, but she's got a lot of baggage that she's carrying, you know, with her family, with her sister being gone, you know, all of these things like that. Can she ever live up, you know, to the way the player, you know, that her sister was? And her sister was not as good, you know, her, her sister Jeannie was not as good a basketball player as uh, Jaya, but she was a team player. She was a really one of those incredible players that can elevate, you know, the entire team and make them all better. And Jai, on the other hand, is kind of like, you know, into herself like that and not really, you know, a team player. Like that. And so it, it was interesting for me when I was writing the book, like because Walt, you know, was one of the top ten offensive linemen, you know, high school uh, linemen in the country. And, you know, got picked up by USC, played in a Rose Bowl against Wisconsin. Of course, then, you know, he lost his deferment, graduated, and went to Vietnam. So his life took another turn like that. But um, it was kind of interesting, like, that, to have Walt, who's kind of like an old-school athlete, you know, and then this young girl like that who's coming up, who's incredibly talented, but, you know, has some lessons to learn about how to be, you know, a team player, like, that, and how to, you know, help su be supportive, you know, of your fellow players and all of that. So it was kind of fun to have them coming from the opposite ends of the spectrum as far as that was concerned, like that. And, um, and yeah. 
Um, it, it became, you know, a, a book that was interesting because the dynamics of basketball and the dynamics of this investigation to try and find out, you know, like what's happening, you know, as they're making their way to this national championship game and actually playing in a national championship game right here in Billings over at the Metra um, was a real joy to write, I have to admit. It was something different, you know, because I put Walt in some really dangerous, you know, and uncomfortable situations, but I've never stuck him on a bus with a whole busload of teenage girls. <laughs> and that's a, that's a dangerous situation. Like, a, you know, I have a 14-year-old, you know, granddaughter, and so I know just how dangerous they can be. Um, but that, you know, kind of, that's how the book kind of, like, came to be, like that. And, uh, you know, it was great, like that, because, you know, I could lean on my guys, like, get up on the res to kind of keep me, you know, pointed in the right directions yeah. and everything like that. But, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, it turned out to be a fun book to write and a different, you know, kind of book to write. Yeah, it was awesome reading it you know, and uh, knowing the, uh, the light that it's going to shed upon uh, issues in Indian country that need to be uh, brought forward, uh, not only for the uh, general public, but within our own nation, too because uh, uh, a lot of that can be prevented uh, through um, health and wellness, uh, through uh, education, uh, those type of things. So um, now it's uh, a, a large light that's going to be uh, shown upon it, so it'll provide us a, a venue to um, get that discussion going, get some funds going in that direction, raise awareness uh, in different types of ways like that. So that's the, types of work, that's the type of work that I do in Indian country, go around and talk about health and wellness and education and uh, just motivate people that um, we don't have to live by uh, the, the past uh, horrific traumas that have happened because there was a, a systematic attempt of genocide upon our people, a conscious effort to wipe us all out uh, by the United States government, but we're still here. And uh, there's a purpose and reason for that. And uh, so we need to find that uh, as individuals within ourselves, what that purpose and reason is. And that's what makes our life so uh, amazing and strong that we can look forward to something like that. So it's amazing to be part of this journey with Craig so that we can continue shedding these lights upon our people. You know, we're more than just uh, stone-faced grunting Indians that you see in uh, movies. You know. you know, we actually have uh, a beautiful way of life that is still in existence today. You know, languages that have been spoken on this uh, land for thousands, thousands of years, you know. Uh, that name, uh, Red Thunder, has been said in this, uh, all the way from Michigan, this area, for thousands of years, and we still carry that on. Same with songs, same with dancing, same with uh, uh, um, stories. Uh, we still have stories that have been that are thousands of years old that we still carry today, uh, traditions and th those ways. So we need to continue to remind our, our native people that, that we have that. We have that rich heritage, that rich culture, and a beautiful way of life. And uh, because there was a systematic attempt, and it wasn't only just a physical, but it was a psychological warfare that tried to bring us down. So we need to remind ourselves, remind each other that we're... Uh, living a good, strong, beautiful way of life, to remember that holistically, take care of ourselves. So I'm going to put my hat out, and I'm going to be taking collections for this homily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm actually proud of like a lot of things about the book, but one of the things that happened, like when I turned it in, when I turned the first draft in, like a, I got a letter from the copy editor, and he and his wife like had made a donation to you know the, the women's resource center in lame deer um yeah and then like you know, and then then viking penguin turned around and made a very substantial donation like it also and then we made them our national uh charity because what we do with longmire days like it's not just a line in everybody's pockets like it, we always have a national charity like and then a local charity that we give all of the you know the the profits you know for longmire days too like and they're the national um, charity for this year like that so once we get you know everything all added up like that and I think that's like probably in November like that they'll get another great big check like that which really I, I feel good about that I really really do like it's I feel national like, in uh, indigenous women's coalition are you asking your boss yeah my boss is sitting <laughs> right over there that's uh, that's my wife there my better half, a way better. Uh, <laughs> she is. My she daughter, is and then my son is back there too. So he's cute too. Yeah, he is. He's he growing like a weed. I know, right? Yeah. 
things. It's good. You can like push the wheelchair around for you when you get older. <laughs> yeah. like that, so good. Yeah. Would yeah. you guys like a reading tonight? Would you like me to do a little reading like it? Okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it over here where I don't have to hold the mic. I'm gonna do this. Um, this is uh, this. Uh, these are always these are fun books for me. I get because um, can, is this on? Is it on? No. Is it on? It's on. Okay. Gavin's like, I told him how to do that. I told him how to use it. <laughs> um, this was a fun one like that because I really like going back up. You know, uh, whenever I can circle back around and do, you know, something that's something I, I did a little bit of before. And, you know, a lot of the res stuff like that came from uh, As the Crow Flies, um, which was like a blast because here's the trick. You know, when I'm always talking about how, you know, my favorite quote about writing is the one from Wallace Stegner on teaching and writing fiction, where he says the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. <laughs> and what a what a cr load, a load of crap that is! I get you know because that's your job to go find interesting people and put them in your books. Well, the problem, of course, is I come from a state where there are only five hundred thousand people, right? <laughs> so everybody knows who I'm talking about generally. Like it, and then it's even worse up on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation because there are only five thousand enrolled members. So whenever I stick one of them in my book, Everybody knows who I'm talking about. And I used to worry about it like that. And then, you know, and, and I finally asked Marcus about it. He goes, yeah, don't worry about it. He says, there are more people pissed off because they're not in your books than there are the ones that are pissed off because they are. <laughs> so it's not a big deal. Like that. And so anyway, this one was a fun one to do like it simply because I was able to go back and, uh, and, and go back to some of those characters that I really enjoyed writing about like that. And um, one of them is Lonnie Littlebird. Um, who's based off a good friend of ours, Charles Little Man. Charles Little Man, like that, who was just hilarious. Like that, he had an incredible sense of humor, and he was one of those guys that like hardly ever knew when he was funny, <laughs> which made it twice as funny, you know. And so uh, I, I, you know, whenever I put him in as a tribal elder, like that, and then I, I even elevated him, and made him into the chief, like that, just because I thought he's too priceless, like that, to not have. And so anyway, the the way it works is, of course, like that, you know, whenever Walt and Henry, you know, go on the res, like that. You know, I mean, Henry doesn't have to ask permission, but Walt does because he doesn't have any jurisdiction there. He has absolutely no jurisdiction whatsoever. And so he can't rely on a lot of the resources that he normally has where he can pull his badge or, you know, show his gun or, you know, lock somebody up or that kind of stuff. He can just go ask some questions. And if somebody didn't want to answer his questions, they tell him to take a hike. And so um, he has to kind of go in and get permission you know, from Lonnie uh, to be able to do this. And it's kind of a tough situation because for those of you who read the books, you also know that Walt is responsible for kind of like absconding with Barrett Long, who is the brother of Lolo Long, who is the tribal police chief. So he's in trouble with her, but he's also in trouble with Lonnie like that because he was kind of like Lonnie's, you know, right-hand man. And so, you know, Walt's kind of got to walk on the eggshells or the thin ice here a little bit in this one scene, but it's here in the office, like that in Lonnie's office, that, uh, that this scene takes place. So hopefully you'll enjoy it like that. So I'm not going to read the whole book because you can do that at home <laughs> um, like that. So here we go. This is actually on uh, page 48. I do not think that this young man is going to work out. Mm hmm Yes, it is so. Glancing around Lonnie Littlebird's office, I couldn't help but have a little bit of wall envy. The head chief of the great northern Cheyenne nation had certificates of achievement from four different presidents of the United States, an official that Lonnie begrudgingly recognized. Documentations of great service from every part of Montana, another bureaucracy he attempted to pay no heed, and credentials of lofty success from every facet of Indian country. You got a Nobel Peace Prize up here on the wall somewhere, Lonnie? <laughs> the old chief ignored me as the young man in question entered, bearing a tray overloaded with coffee pot, cups, saucers, milk, sugar, and silver spoons, all of which he carefully slid onto Lonnie's mammoth oak desk. The young man stood, hair parted to the right, iron shirt and polished shoes at the ready. Will there be anything else, Chief? Lonnie ushered him away with a vague wave of his hand, and then joined us in watching him go, the glass panel door with the tribal seal and Lonnie's name and gold leaf quietly closing behind him. Henry reached out and began pouring coffee for the three of us. What's his name? You know? I don't know. <laughs> Lonnie sat back in his wheelchair and thought, Willard! His name is Willard! <laughs> he thought about it some more. Wasn't there a movie about a rat named Willard? <laughs> The bear finished pouring Lonnie's uh, cup in the saucer. I think the rat's name was Ben, and the boy who controlled him's name was Willard. 
The chief leaned over, looking through the frosted glass to see if the young man might be loitering near. I could see Willard controlling rats. <laughs> I'd take my coffee and stood and walked over to the Wall of Fame, sure that if I looked long enough, I'd see the heads of the enemies who had underestimated the legless man. Seems like a nice kid to me. Lonnie waited patiently as Henry, familiar with the old chief's tastes, dropped two cubes of sugar into his coffee and then added a spoon before sliding the cup and saucer the rest of the way in front of him. Yeah, you'll think that until the rats show up. <laughs> I turned to look at him. He sipped his coffee and glanced up at me. He's too polite. I'm always thinking he's up to something. I shook my head and sipped my own coffee. You want your old driver back? At the sound of Barrett Long, the old man brightened. How's he doing? Fantastic. He's dispatching on weekends and covering for Ruby whenever she, he wants a day off. Ruby, that's that good-looking woman that's in your office. Pushing 80, I was pretty sure that the, my dispatcher would be pleased at this description. <laughs> one of them. Has he gotten his gun yet? No. He won't have one until he goes through training down in Douglas before he's armed. He wants a gun. Yeah, I know, but even his own sister, the police chief, wouldn't give him one. She is a harsh woman. Mm -hmm, yes, it is so. <laughs> well, you're her boss. If you wanted to, you could tell her to order her to give him or her brother a gun. He shook his head and stared at the coffee. I am just the chief. Doesn't that mean that everybody has to do what you say? No, hardly anybody does what I say. I glanced at Henry, who rolled his eyes. <laughs> Lonnie sat his cup down and looked at me again. You want to buy some of my commendations? I'll make you a deal on them. <laughs> I gestured with my cup. Lonnie, they got your name on them. Oh, a little white out, and you can put any name you want to on them. <laughs> he leaned back, placing his fingers on the leather blotter that were spread out before him. How about this desk? Would you like to buy this desk? <laughs> Lonnie, it's your desk. Not really. That thief who had the position before me stole it and had him bring it in here. <laughs> he pulled open a drawer and then slid it closed. I keep looking for all the money that he stole, but I can't find it yet. <laughs> Lonnie, have you heard about the situation with Jaya Long? <laughs> ah, the basketball player. Henry nodded. That threat's against her life. <laughs> I came back and sat resting my cup on the purloined desk. Yes, one moon. That is a tragic family. The grandfather, he is a good man, and his wife, they tried to keep their daughter safe, but somehow they could not keep her on the straight and narrow. That is the way sometimes. Do you know anyone who might know who has been threatening Jaya? Uh, there are the usual threats whenever our players go out into the white world, but these people are only misguided, not particularly dangerous, just racially overly enthusiastic. <laughs> he glanced at me. But you think we have a case? <laughs> what do you know about the sister, Jeannie? Oh... Well, the old saying among our people is that you can never conquer an enemy until their women's hearts are on the ground. But what if there are no women at all? He looked up at me. What is it? That is why I'm glad you are here, to, my friend. I am hoping you can help us in this most horrible of atrocities. How many Native women go missing here, Lonnie? Close to 300 missing persons reports last year alone. We make up only 6% population, but account for 26% of the missing persons. The majority are, are who are women. Most of our cases are closed within a day or two. Runaway teenagers, tribal police find them walking on the roads, or child custody cases that are resolved. But the statistics remain that our people make up more than a quarter of the ones who go missing in the state. We're going to have to go around and knock on some doors and maybe ask some uncomfortable questions. He glanced up at me. You are asking for my blessing? I guess we are. The bear sipped his coffee and then lowered his cup into the saucer. Lonnie, have you ever heard of the Eovetse Heomese? He started. On his face, we could see the words rested something deep within him. I have not heard that term since I was very young. But you have heard it. Yes. There was a girl that I knew. She was strange and something of an outsider who just didn't fit in anywhere. You would see her out in places where nobody was, all alone. And I remember my mother told me not to be like her, that the Eovetse Heomese would come and take me away if I lingered too long from the company of the people. And one day in the schoolyard, I saw her standing out by the fence, and I went to her, and I told her that if she persisted, the Eovetse Heomese would come and take her away. And all she said was, at least somebody will want me. He reached out and took his coffee, holding it in both hands as if attempting to stay warm. I told my mother about this, and she said that I should befriend this girl and look out for her. The next day, I went to school with great emotion, ready to tell this girl that I was her newfound friend and would protect her. He took a sip of coffee. 
she was gone, and I never heard of her spoken again. We waited, but he was silent. Lonnie? He looked up at me. You have my blessing. This is where we open it up and let you guys ask questions like that, but there's already been like, you know, a couple of questions before. Like that. So, oh, well, we had some new people come in. So you new people, it's your job to ask some questions. Like that. So let's let you know. Anybody? It's a quiet group tonight. We've talked you out already. One fell swoop. Is that a correct assumption? This is a segue into the next? It kind of is. It kind of is. Like, I mean, you know, we get a beginning, a middle, and an end to this book, but uh, there's more, uh, which this is kind of touching upon. And uh, that's actually one of the fun parts for me, I have to admit. Like, it's, it's also a little, it's a, it's a kind of a deal for Marcus and I, too, like that, in that, um, you know, the spirituality in the books is really, really important to me. Um, but, you know, one of the fun things for me is also the way that both Walt and, and Henry approach that spirituality like that. Because, I mean, Walt is a detective. You know, he's an investigator. Like, and so for him, the world is empirical data. It's all facts. You know, it's like an episode of, uh, 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 it's like an episode of um, Dragnet. You know, nothing but the facts. And with Henry... It's that it's it's whenever Marcus and I are talking like that. I mean, it's that spiritualism and mysticism that makes up you know the entirety of the world. That it's so much more out there, you know. And I'm always laughing about it whenever I'm talking about it with him because I'm always you know physically aware that my kind of people have only been on this continent for a couple of hundred years. His kind of people have been here for a couple thousand, and they might know a little bit more about what's going on you know around us than you know we do. And so for me, it's always interesting to see that you know that argument that goes on between. Walt and Henry, because Walt, you know, is not a believer like it, and Henry is a true believer like it. And so, for me, there's there's the differences between the two of them make for an awful lot of good conversations. It seems like yeah, that balance, you know, be, be going in between like the spiritual part, coming back into the reality of what's going on. There was a story that I heard about these uh, young men that were in a sweat lodge. And so some of you may not know what a sweat lodge is. It's one of our ancient ceremonies that we have. It's a sauna. It's made out of willows and then uh, hides or blankets. And then we heat up rocks in a fire, then bring them in with a uh, pitchfork and then pour water on that. And it's a ceremony. And within our way of life, different things start to symbolize different things within our life. So they tell us that uh, steam... That heat, it'll represent different things that are in, within your life. So these three men were in there. And there was a young, two younger men started arguing. They said, the reason why it gets hot in the sweat is because you're so full of sin. It's all that sin that it's in you that's making that heat so intense. And the other guy said, well, I think it's because I'm righteous man. I have no sin. And it makes that heat intense, but I don't feel it because I'm a righteous man. And that old man was in there. He said, you're both full of shit. The reason why it gets hot in here is because we got that guy pouring all that water on them hot rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so what's uh, amazing about my brother here is yeah, he, he, he um, maintains that balance within that book. When things get a little too serious, bring in some humor. You know, that's the way our life is, and, that, and that's what he grasped onto. And, uh, you know, the spirit of intent is powerful. What you truly intend to do in the beginning, it's always going to come out. That's why Longmire is so successful, is because of the intent in the beginning. When uh, Craig and I got together, we talked about it. We even went in ceremony, went in sweat together, went to the elders and to Charles. They gave us a blessing. And even when uh, Lou Diamond came over, when we first started the... Um, uh, the pilot, before we even filmed the pilot, Lou came and stayed with me for about four days. We went over to Lame Deer, hung out, and had a good time, went to the schools, did some assemblies, went to the old folks' home. Them old ladies just were loving him up, trying to give him hickeys. <laughs> we had a good time, and then again, He's Charles... He's not bashful either. He'll like break no. into La Bamba at a heartbeat. No, he like just that, jumped you know? right into it. Yeah. Cheyenne say we have uh, uh, the you know Cheyennes and Crows. I was telling you kind of animosity and Crows. They adopted Obama back in 2000, 
12, I think, somewhere around there. And then the Cheyenne said, well, crows have Obama, we got La Bamba. Because <laughs> they adopted, uh, Cheyenne's adopted Lou into their tribe uh, through um, Tiger, your Tiger Scalp Cane, yeah. So anyway. You had your hand up. Well, it was to talk about the spirituality in the Northern Cheyenne. I was just, how does that, when there's someone lost, and their spirit is gone. How does how does that fit in? I mean, how do you how does the your people? They, I'm trying to understand that whole thing, you know, because they're gone. How do you deal well, different with ways of different families? You know, within our tribe, we're not all um, traditional ways. You know, you utilize those ways. So some are uh, Christian. Some natives are Buddhists. Uh, some are atheists, some follow our traditional ways, you know, we're a little microcosm to the way United States is right now, but um, so each family is different, you know, on ways, uh, I've been in some ceremonies where they, they use eagle bone whistle, call their spirit back, and, uh, you know, that, that provides some comfort with uh, the family members that are in there. Uh, some families call upon a Catholic priest to come over, so... Um, you know, we carry these idealistic ways of how Indians are, you know, from movies and things that we see, but we're just regular people. Deal with it the way that if you were, if you lost a, a daughter or a son, um, probably deal with it the same way you would. You know, that's the amazing thing about Longmire. It shows that we're, we're just human. All these things we go through is just humanity. You know, we might have different color, different color skin, but we're, you know, all comes down to just humanity is what it is. So there was one that was kind of interesting to me was the color red, you know, which is that, you know, the spirits, that's the one color they can see, um, which I think is from blood, right? It's, it's you know, the message is like, a, the, you know, they can see blood. And then one of the images that they use, you know, for murdered and missing indigenous women is the red handprint, you know, over the face, which they used, you know, on the front of the book. Um, like it, which I think you know, was extraordinarily powerful. Like it, and then um, in the book, like it, you know, Jeannie supposedly is wearing this like you know red scarf, like that, which is like a carrying trope, you know, through the book too, like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's always startling, you know, whenever you you know you see these things like that and see what a connection that they have, um, and there's so much history that goes along behind them. Um, it's kind of amazing, I gotta admit. Like that, it's a, a treasure trove for an author. You know, because the details, you know, are always going to be, you know, what it is that's going to make it work and what's not going to make it work. And um, that was e even interesting, too, like that, because, I mean, there are a lot of little things um, in the book, like that, in the books that are true. Um, I remember when we first went up to go talk to Tiger, like at about uh, the, the team and everything, he had a pair of, of glasses in his pocket that he kept, you know, fingering and playing with, like at, and I looked and I thought, you know, those are too small, there's no way they'd ever fit on him. And I asked Marcus about it and he goes, oh, that's, those were his sons, is what they were, like that, and I just, you know, and when I, you know, when I dedicated the book to his son, um, I told him, like, and I said, you, you better read this book, you know, because I didn't, you know, I, I, I used to change the names, you know, for, for characters like that, but anymore, nine times out of ten, I don't. You know, if I use somebody in a book like that, and they didn't kill anybody or do anything like that, you know, but I'll just leave them in the book. Like, and so, you know, I said, you better read this book because, you know, A, you're in it, and, you know, B, there's some personal things about your life like that are actually in this book, and I'm happy to take them out. I'm happy to remove them. I'm happy to change the characters and do something completely different. He wrote me back, and he goes, do not change a thing. You know, leave it all in there. He says, this was so important to me that, you know, that this, you know, was an um, you know an homage like you know to my son, and to bring that all back like that he said you know it's just so worthwhile and thank you look at and so you know once again you know you get to do you know little things like that that you know really mean something um, you know I mean you know it, it's an immortality thing you know I mean there you are on the shelves of the Library of Congress like that you know and I don't know I don't know if it's any better than that so yes ma'am. Well, sir, thank you very much for the work that you and your wife do. It's very, Im she's gone, very important and Based blessings time. in your journey. I, I, thank you. Um, and the last time you were in Billings, I mean, I think it was the last time, it was several years ago that we, we saw you at a, the store here in town. Um, you spoke about 
doing something about Alaska? Has that come to fruition yet? <laughs> well, you guys are going to forget everything. <laughs> Actually, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a novella that I'm working on called Tooth and Claw from the Tennyson, you know, old nature, you know, red of tooth and claw. And, um, yeah, I'm like about, oh, I can't tell you how far I am on that like that. But, but the good news is, is with quarantine, you know, that's actually what I did. I spent the majority of my time, you know, whenever I'm doing interviews, people are always like, you know, well, what kind of an effect has quarantine had on you, Craig? And I'm always like, you do know I live, my ranch is outside of town of 25, right? <laughs> you know, and I, and I go in a room by myself and type about my imaginary friends for a living, <laughs> you know. And I, I, I wait and give them a long pause and go, why, is there something going on I should know about? <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, it, the great thing is I haven't been traveling, I haven't been going anywhere, and we haven't been doing any of the overseas tours or anything like that, so I turned this year's book in, like, four months early. <laughs> So that gives me four months to like work on some other stuff. And the first thing that came up immediately was Tooth and Claw, like it, which is that novella. So I'm, I'm back on the saddle on that one, like that, just so you know. But thank you for bringing that up. Like it so makes me feel good that I remembered it and I'm actually working on it, too. Well, it's a, near, a, dear, a place near and dear to our hearts. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Alaska is kind of like, you know, the high plains on steroids, <laughs> you know. I, I mean, that was like, you know, I mean, I've had like some experiences, you know, around here. You know, in Montana, like getting down in Wyoming, like that, but boy, you know, I mean, the last trip I went up there fishing, I almost got eaten by a bear, you know, right off the bat. Like, and I don't know if I told you guys that story, like that, that was the one where, you know, I, they let me off on a sandbar and said, so go down to the end of the sandbar, like, and then wade across. The water's only about four feet deep, and there's a big rock up there. You can climb up on the rock and you can fish off of that. And I went down, like, you know, 100 yards, like, I get to the end tailings, like, and I started splashing into the water, and I could see this big, huge rock, and I was like, that's fantastic, it's great, what a perspective, I can see where the fish are and everything, like, I started splashing into the water, and then the, the boulder rolled over and stood up. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, I was, like, about as far, <laughs> yeah, about as far as from, like, here to where the glass booth is there. And that thing stood up like that, and I'm thinking, I'm, like, two bounds away. You know, and I found out, you never, you know, you always wonder what you'll do if, when you die. <laughs> I found out what I'm going to do, like, okay? because that thing rolled over, stood up, and it was like 10 feet tall. Like, it, it's looking at me like this, and it kind of leaned forward a little bit, and I think it was just as surprised as I was that I was there. <laughs> and it leaned forward, and it just went, Whoa. like, it, just a little woof, <laughs> you know, just to really see maybe what I would do. Like, it, I started talking a mile a minute. Like, it, I was like, I just was like, you bet. You, but whatever you say, I'm all for it. Like, no, nah, I'm with you 100%. Like, you know, what you said just now, and I'm just rattling along. And this bear is just looking at me like this, you know. And I thought, well, at least I'm confusing him. Like, that, you know, at least that's good, right? And uh, about then, I hear the guys that were in the float boat, you know, about 100 yards away. They got their air horns and their bells, and they're running down there. <laughs> so they look down, they see this thing, you know, standing over top of me. They come running down there. And I swear this bear looked like that then. And then turned around and looked at me and was like, because <laughs> like lunch just got broken up like okay, you know and then he just like turned around and went my ambled right up the hill like getting into the weeds like you know disappeared like you know but but yeah like I love that place it's a hoot and uh, and I had uh, I, I don't know I shouldn't tell you guys about that book I'm not gonna tell you about it because you're just you're just trying to weed it weasel it out of me and I'm not gonna let you do it like it's a, so but yeah it's a it's gonna be a fun one it's a fun one because what happens is Walt's working on a, a oil derrick. Um, up, you know, on the, uh, um, uh, way up on the north slope, like that. And, you know, Henry gets the word that he thinks maybe Walt might be drinking too much. And there's, you know, a woman back in Wyoming that wants Walt to come back to Wyoming. And so Henry is dispatched, you know, to go and uh, straighten Walt out and maybe bring him back, like that. And so, so, and of course, it's never that simple. So, you know, with these two guys, never. So. Somebody else had their hand up. Look at it. I think I. Did I not see somebody with their hand up? Did I make that up? I guess I did. Like, it. Well, okay, sure. Well, you had talked about Johnston Atoll. I'm bringing that up again because, yeah. yeah. Any further? Gotten any further on that? One? Oh yeah. Well, the problem is, is like, and I'll tell you how this evolved. I'll tell you how it evolved. Um, I, I rapidly came to the conclusion if I was going to write a series of books about the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state, that I couldn't rapidly turn it into murder capital USA, you know. It would be kind of hilarious, you know, after a while. It would be almost like, hey, let's kill somebody, but first, let's go to Absaroka County to do it, you know. <laughs> and so um, what I thought was is the only way that I could, like, you know, pair that off a little bit was to have Walt go out of the county and go other places. 
And so I did, you know, so I started doing the Walt books almost like, you know, a ball team. So it's almost like home and away. And so what I do is like one would take place in Absaroga County and then there would be one that's away. And since the one in Johnston Atoll, like at when he gets kicked out of Vietnam by the Provost Marshal of the you know, Marine Corps, would be a, a very far away book, you know, because not only would it be a far away geographically, but also um, chronologically, you know, because I'd have to go back to like 1969, 1970. Um, I thought that one's got to be pushed back, you know, a little bit, you know, for a couple of years before I can jump on that one. But yeah, I've already started doing research on it like that, you know, and you know, developing thought, you know, of what it is that's going to happen in that particular book and all that. But it's, I used to worry about running out of ideas. Now I'm just worried about dying before I get them all written, you know. And believe me, that bear had a big effect on that, like I got to tell you. That when the horse ran over top of me three days before I was going out on tour and, you know, broke one of my ribs, like, and I'm laying there, you know, in the barn looking up at the ceiling and going, I've only written 17 books. Like, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, so, so I, I've, they're all like horses jockeying for position to see what'll be the next book. I'm getting so far, you know, I'm holding them off like that, so we'll see what happens. But eventually, yeah, it's another one that'll, that'll definitely happen. It's just a question of when, when it'll come to the forefront, so. Anybody else? I have uh, kind of a personal question. Uh oh. Uh, Stephen Ambrose, who wrote uh, Crazy Horse and Custer, did you ever? He spent time on the on the Northern Cheyenne Res. Did you? Did you ever get a chance to meet him? No, or? I never did. Look, I, I've never met him. Um, when was the book written? When was that book written? Uh, about twenty years ago. Okay. Yeah. Is that in Spirit of Crazy Horse? The one about AIM? No, it's about. It's a parallel. Like he parallels the lives of Crazy Horse and Custer. Okay. Okay. It's, he's, he was a historian. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good gosh, yeah. The, the Nathaniel Philbrick one was the one that I immediately latched on to because it was, you know, really modern, like, and, like, he had used, like, all of the forensic information that they had garnered here most recently. And, and he's a pretty amazing historian because he, he does a really great job of giving you an, an overview of, you know, the, and, you know, I mean, you can get bogged down in some of those like that, you know, where you're seeing the history leading up to the battle and all that kind of stuff, or the period after the battle and things like that. And I just wanted a really clear overview, like and it was the Nathaniel Philbrick, um, The Last Stand, I think is the title of it. Like, and so, and I know uh, Nate Philbrick, like, he's a really great guy. I got to do the, the, the Nantucket Book Festival, which was really kind of weird, because I'm definitely the only guy that was on Nantucket that had a cowboy hat on. I can just about guarantee you like it. But, uh, but yeah, that was a really great one. Like, I mean, you can go, look, I mean, I, I've got a list of books like that that I use, you know, like for research purposes, like it, in, uh, in the acknowledgement section um, of Next to Last Stand, like that. But uh, yeah, no, I never, never ran into Ambrose at all like that, so. It doesn't mean he wasn't there. It just means we weren't there at the same time. Yeah, like that, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. published in 96. 96, okay. So that was a while back. Woof. More than 20 years, my friend. Back in the 1900s. <laughs> Back in the 1900s. They're getting yeah. by you again here, oh, aren't they? Man. <laughs> last century. Remember the last century? <laughs> I always say that. Back in the turn of the century. You know, the other one. <laughs> before. Anybody else? If we bored you enough for one night. Like that. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you know, the, the, the Billings Public Library for allowing us to have this magnificent space. I want to thank this house of books, like that, for bringing books over. And you better thank my wife back there for hauling all the swag in, too, like that, because she, she did a you know, pretty great job there. So she's, she's pretty handy with a hand truck, isn't she? Like that. And I also want to thank my good buddy, Marcus Redd, for being thank here you, this Greg. evening. Yep. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. You guys have a good night. It's a good opportunity to get a signature on a book, is what I can tell you. Like that's yeah, those are rare. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've signed a few. Me, I've signed a no few. big deal. Like that, but Marcus, yeah, that's kind of important. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you guys. Thank you.